morning, everybody. How y'all doing today? Y'all want to get to your feet with us? Let's go ahead and start the service off with some prayer. Thank you, God, for another day. Thank you that we get to come to your house, Lord, to spend some time with you and to just be reminded of who you are. God, I ask that you would bless every single person here, those that are on their way, that they would get here safe. Those that are coming from Spanish, if they would get here safe, God, we ask that you would just open our hearts to receive from you today, that we would hear the words we need to hear, that we would receive the wisdom that we need to receive. In Jesus' name, we continue to worship you, God, because you are faithful. We just ask that you would continue to remind us of that. In Jesus' name, amen. So the verse I want to share with you guys today is 1 Corinthians 2, 9. It says, However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. There's another verse in the Bible that says that the ways of God is higher, just as, you know, the earth is lower, the skies are higher than the earth, so are God's ways higher than ours, so are his thoughts higher than ours, amen? So with this verse, what I want to share is that God has a future plan for us. And the, the Bible says it's what no ear has heard, what no eye has seen. Can you just take a moment to realize that we haven't even seen the full glory of God? We've only seen a piece of it, but we haven't seen the full thing. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that make you excited? Because the Bible says that he has something prepared for us. Can you imagine what he has prepared for us? The Bible says that he has a table prepared for us. The Bible says that he has a house prepared for us. He has a future for us. Our future's in heaven. Amen. It's not here. This is temporary. It's in heaven. Amen. And just to think that we haven't even seen the full thing yet. That amazes me. So today, let's just continue to glorify him because his mercy is just, it's so overwhelming. Amen. Amen. Amen.
you for your name, God, God, without judgment. Lord, we thank you for your mercy, God, that you receive us when we're at our worst and that you lift us up, God. That you don't turn away from us when we need you the most, Lord, you get on the floor with us and you pick us up. We worship you, God, because of your mercy. We worship you because there is no
much good luck that you are faithful, God. And today we declare that you are the king of our heart. There is no one else worthy of taking that place, Lord. That place belongs to you, God. And we worship you because you are the king of kings and lord of lords. And there is no other name that is worthy of that title, God. Fill this place with your presence.
We boast of a life that dreams of the dying many times, but you're always good. We walk in the valley of shadow death, but you're there. You're good. We walk through trying times, and you are there. We thank you, Lord, because you're there. You never let us down. You're always there to help us, to lead us, to guide us. We need to understand to be patient, to wait upon you. You've got our backs. You're taking care of us. You're leading us on higher ground. You're teaching us what it's like to serve you and to prosper, to prosper you and to wait upon the Lord. For the Bible says, on the way upon the Lord, they will be renewed their strength. And I pray for the ones that are walking the difficult night this morning, that they depend on you and trust you and understand and confess that you are good all the time. You are good. The good and the bad, you're good all the time. You never fail. Heavenly Father, as we go into the Lord, I pray a special anointing, Lord, the Lord of your love, of your wisdom, and I share my heart for this congregation. Bless this word. Bless the people. I ask it in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And then we say, let there be light. Light. And there it is. Say, I say, light. 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 We will go out to their circuits and we will see you again. your physical 
He says, no, 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 why me, why me, why me, why me? And we talked about the two disciples after the resurrection of Christ going to Emmaus. And Jesus appeared and walked with them, and they had no idea who he was. And I told you that they accepted Jesus Christ. Scripture says, no longer do I live, but Christ lives within me from the very beginning. How many believers do I have this morning? Amen. He's already there. People, he is already there. We're just looking around trying to find him, and he's closer than the air you breathe. Now, last week, we started the second series of this, and it says that when Jesus arrives, he's going to teach the first thing he does is that everything is done in his time. We have this mindset, this idea that because I come to church, because I'm a Christian, because I give my tithes, I care about what you do. It's not ironic. God has a way of putting things into perspective. This morning, I was getting ready to come to church. I was listening to a preacher speak. And he said something that really caught my attention. I said, wow, this is awesome, Says He said the following words, God does not work for you, you work for God. Amen. I said, wow, you need to understand that. You don't tell him how to do it, where to do it, when to do it, you just wait upon the Lord. You understand that the moment he came into your life, he will supply your every need. He's in charge of all things. He wants you to prosper, he wants you to be blessed. He sees you walking in your moments of desperation, and yet he wants to walk with you if you allow him to. But so many times in our mindset, we have this concept that I need to call the shots. And we said last week was this, that just because you belong to the family of God doesn't give you the right to put God on a judgment stand. You don't have that right. You don't have that right to tell God when or why he's going to do something for your life. And we're, we're working on the book of, book of John chapter 11. Put scripture back to the whole chapter. We're going to break it down. We're going to break that whole chapter about when Jesus arrives, he's going to teach you everything is done in his time. In his time. And I told you last Sunday, we're still there about Jeremiah 33. Call upon me and I will answer. So we may make my things you know not of. People get a hold of that as a believer. The Bible says, call upon me, he's going to answer. But understand, I said last week, he never said when. He never gave you a time. He said, call upon me and I will answer. He never told you in a week, right now, on down the road. He never told you when. He said, trust me. Trust me. We deliver the message. So in the story that we're dealing with, it's uh, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, friends of Jesus. Where Jesus, every time he came to Bethany, he would stop at their house. He would just, he would turn around and they would crash and everything. Just kind of sit back. Because they were friends. They were friends there. So when... Lazarus gets sick. Mary and Martha feel like they have the right to ask Jesus to come. They know that if Jesus comes and he arrives, then Lazarus would be healed. So they send out a messenger to go get Jesus. And they called out, why? Because they expected Jesus to come. When they sent out, they had all the assurance that Jesus was going to show up because after all, it's Lazarus' his friend. I mean, you'd be the other people that the only one related to him, the only one close to him, they had seen him work great miracles for other people. Why not his friend? His personal, why not? In their mind, in their heart, in their disposition, he's going to come back running in a hurry. They send word, messengers get up there, they tell Jesus, hey, uh, Lazarus is really sick. Tell him, I'm coming. I'm coming. And I said that in the message last Sunday that when they said that they use the terminology that youth do today, we tell them, clean your room in a moment. Jesus said, in a moment. In a moment. When? In his moment. When in his time. And we said the reason why it's always in his time is that he might be glorified. That we might understand, not because I'm going to answer when you want, how you want, you kind of condition him because then we'd be a bunch of spoiled brats. In moments we didn't get who you wanted, we give up and walk away. He's going to teach you that he's in control. You need to understand the focus is when he's going to do things and how he's going to do it because you've asked him to do it. So get your hands off and let God work. So where we're at right now and then the message, all right, Jesus doesn't show up. So how discouraged do you think Martha and Mary were? They were like, Bob, that room. What did he say? He said he's coming. But when? He said he's coming. But, but what else did he say? Then he's coming. Just wait. So now we pick up the story. It's four days later. He got there. He's arrived. And we're used to uh, turn around the other day. We would say, Martha and Mary would say, Yeah, really, please put for now. It's over. He's dead. We buried him. Why are you here now? We needed you four days ago. We don't need you now. 
It's all said and done. It's taken care of. In their mind, in their heart, they already accepted defeat. They already said, it's useless. Wow, all we did for him, he never showed up. So then when Jesus shows up, he didn't make it to the house. He's at the edge of the uh, town coming in. And then Martha gets a glimpse, and she goes running. Running. And throws up on the feet of Jesus and said, Jesus, had you been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now those words to me are speaking about someone that had extreme confidence and felt comfortable speaking to him in that way. She like putting it out there like, ah. And I often I stop and say, what would I be doing? Well, what do we do in our lives? When God doesn't answer, what we want him to answer? What's our mindset? How do we pray? What do we say at that moment? Don't we come up, you don't care, you don't love me, you don't understand me? We come up with all this kind of stuff, people. And here's Martha and Mary. Their brother is now dead. And they knew if Jesus would have come, we wouldn't have this problem. And see, you need to understand something. When you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God does understand. And he's going to do his way that his name might be glorified. So they have this conversation. And then Jesus, I imagine, just looks down and gets her up says, Good Martha. He will rise again. Don't worry about it. And then Martha was well instructed because her answer is scriptural. The answer she gives Jesus is scriptural. Yeah, he'll rise at the last day. And she was right. Because according to the word of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first Amen. at the last day. Now here we are, 2,000 years ago, taking care of Lazarus being dead. He said he'll rise again. Yeah, here we are two thousand years later, and it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't. That last day hasn't happened yet. She had reason. She she was answering scripturally. She said, "I understand." But on the last day, and so many times we want to confine God and what He can do and when He can do it, and all establishing a format, a foundation for your belief, trying to awaken the reality that you're standing in the presence of the Great I Am. You're standing the one that has the power over death. The one that will, a few weeks later, just two days later, because it happens right before the, the, the death of Jesus Christ, this is that happens. Then a few days later, about, about, about a week, ten days later, he would then be risen from the dead, and he himself would say, now I have all power in heaven and earth. He had conquered death. He was now the great I am. That's who's standing in front of her. People, do you understand who your Jesus is? Amen. Do you realize how much he really cares? You understand that he hasn't forsaken you, hasn't given up on you, and it's by you being very religious at times when you're going through a trying time. You need to understand above all things, God loves you. Amen. And he's not going to do anything, nothing to destroy your faith in him. You, he will do nothing to take you down, but he will teach you how to be patient and to wait upon the Lord. He's going to teach you that he is the source. And see, so many times we have needs in our lives, and it's ironic, but I used to hear this where people say, I did this and that and the other, and nothing worked. And then at the end, I come to Jesus. Why do we wait to get desperate to come to Jesus? Why? Why do we wait until the moment that we feel that there is no hope? Why do we wait until that moment when he's there ready to meet our every needs? It's easier to lean on somebody that we can see. It's easier to speak to someone to pick up a phone and talk to him. And we're not very patient about waiting upon the Lord. Because we want our needs to be in the net now. Yes. And Jesus said to her, you understand something? He says, we go to the book of John, verse number 23 and 20 through 25. And these are the exchange they had. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the day resurrect resurrection the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Though he is dead and believes in me, though they die, shall they live. Do you know who you're Amen. talking to? Do you know, understand who you're talking to? I am life. I'm life. That's who you're talking to. A promise is still for Lazarus. Put a foundation for our preaching at funeral services. Every service I preach, and countless service I preach, funeral services, I go to that promise. Our love will left us with a promise made. To Martha and Mary about Lazarus, Jesus said, I am the resurrection, and they will rise again, because Jesus said. The promise of it. He builds a, a mindset, an idea to let him know, don't get so desperate. Don't get so desperate. I'm here, I'm in the house. 
And people, there's nothing greater than to know when you're walking the valley of shed death that the Spirit of God is with you. His presence is with you. Listen, she's in the presence of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And today, you and I have the same, we can do the very same thing. And we go through a difficult time. And we're coming to say, God, why? Why, why, why? why? Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I love you. I'm going to do what's best for you. I'm still in control of all things. The day you entrusted me with your life, that day I became the Lord over your life. I'm going to walk with you and lead you and guide you and prosper you. I will explain to you, just be patient. Just wait upon me because you're not just anybody. You're my child and I love you. And because that love, he built up that hope. So here goes Martha running back to the house to go speak to Mary. And it speaks her in the ear. He says, Jesus is here. Jesus has arrived. And he wants to talk to you. See, and there's a big old crowd there. Lots of people have gone there to mourn with them and go through the whole process of mourning and all. And here we are, four days later, and they're still around. Pray, uh, praying with them, praying with them, whatever, just trying to console them. And he says, he wants to speak. And so she gets up and she hears that and she runs out of the house. And right away the people said, oh, she's going to the church and they'll go back. They join her. You know, people are really kind of get in the way sometimes. <coughs> How many sometimes like to be just left alone? Amen. Mm-hmm. I don't want to see the hands and all good people watch out for that. <laughs> Jesus didn't call for everybody. He called for one. His interest was in Martha. Everybody else was accepting defeat also. I need to talk to her. I need to talk to her. Talk to her in the ear. And Martha tells Mary, he's over there. Go. The Bible says he was still outside of the village. He hadn't come to the house yet. He's there. When she runs out, well, here goes everybody shredding after her. She's going to go weak. Let's go join her. Come on, this morning. They'll be with us. They're, Whoa, there's Jesus. And the very same, very same deal. She runs and throws herself at the feet of Jesus. She looks up, as you've been here, my brother would have died. Why was she saying that? Because she had the whole expectation in her religious experience. She knew who Jesus was. But it hadn't happened the way she thought it was going to happen. So now she's saying, here's your brother. I, I believe in you. Because come on. Let's look, let's read between the lines. See, that's what makes the Bible interesting. People did read blah, 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 blah. Read between the lines, between the lines. She says, had you been here, would have been here. I mean, she's really pointing her finger saying, what happened? So it's a big deal now, yeah, you know. When the Spanish service hears this service, they're going to be called, yeah, I can't. <laughs> but she just now, it's all said and done. She has no ray of hope. She hasn't heard what he told Martha. She's coming to receive her portion of it and tell her side of the story because the story has many different angles, many different concepts because God is a God of variety. He, we're not all the same. We're all different the way we do things. Amen. People understand something. There's believers in the church are very patient and others that are not very patient, yet we're all believers, yes or not? And so he's establishing, wait, wait, calm down. Calm down. He says, Take me where you put him. And the Bible says that they all went to the graveside. And everybody was filled with emotion. Everybody was crying. And when Jesus got to the point where the tomb is at, he looks at the tomb. Everybody is crying. And Jesus joins them. And the Bible says, and Jesus went. This shows a physical, emotional side of Jesus Christ, the clarity. Calvin said in the past, in other messages, for how many people who are now in their spiritual tomb is God standing up and Jesus standing in front of and weeping because of your unbelief. Weeping because of your disposition not being positive. Weeping because you doubt him after all he's done for you. How many have been blessed in the past? Amen. Amen. Why do we doubt? Amen. Why do we give up? Amen. Why do we quit? It's not over till it's over. There's always a hope. I tell you all people that were wearing that light, we always have a hope. We always have a hope that, okay, we had a chance to reach that 
this much time, that we can still live with Jesus in our minds, we create a miracle. Why can't we do it in our spiritual world? To understand that we're on the team that never loses when we embrace Jesus Christ. Because everything that comes down is a victory for our lives. He didn't answer what I wanted. It's a victory for your life. He didn't teach you how to, how to deal with these things in your life. We're good. How many like to win? How many like to lose? How many are used to losing anyway? <laughs> Like, oh, really, really, really. No, no, no. So, <laughs> we, we got a war going on back here. <laughs> but the bottom line is this, that because you can't just sit there and think back and say, oh, no, God doesn't. No, no, you can't be there, people. Get your head up. Lift up your head. Understand, God is still with you. Amen. If he weeps, he weeps because he loves you. He's driven by emotions. He understands that in your most difficult time, he's going to be there. And you don't realize that you're in the grave. You're behind that rock. You're not receiving from God. You shut him off. You release your faith. You shut off your faith in Jesus Christ. You're walking not by faith. You're walking in your flesh, forgetting that faith will move the hand of God. You need to understand, he stands in front of the lives of many. There's some sitting here today, as they're watching over Facebook. You are behind that stone in that saying it's hopeless and there's no use. So then, when Jesus has his moment of weeping, then he says, remove the stone. And Martha says, oh, no, 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 no. Jesus, don't you understand? He's been dead four days. He stinks. The minds are still. He smells. He smells. No, 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 no. What was Jesus' answer to her? I love it. Mm -hmm. don't you believe and I told you that you will see the glory of God I told you to see the glory let me explain this to you the presence of God is what you feel Amen. how many have felt the presence of God before Amen. Amen. that's what you feel the glory of God is what you see the manifestation of God's miracles are working what is he telling her she's not listening very good I mean have you ever said something people aren't really listening <coughs> He said, haven't I told you you will see the glory of God? What is she saying? You're going to see a miracle in just a little bit. You're going to see a miracle. But we're so deep set in our defeat, we can't, we're not listening. They're giving us every reason to go forward. They're giving us every reason to believe. They're giving us every reason to move forward instead of receiving. You say, like, oh my God, all you can think about is he stinks. That's what it stinks. Now, when Jesus said, remove the stone. I believe, and let's see how many believe with me. Jesus could have risen Lazarus from the dead with the stone in place. How many believe that? Amen. Even the stone was there, he called him out. Yes or no? Yes. You know what this means when he said remove the stone? There's a barrier between me and the one that needs a miracle. Get it out of the way. See, some people are difficult times because there's stones between them. You're blocking God's blessing out of your life. You are. Not God, you are. By your mindset, by your attitude, by your impatience, by your action and reaction, you're setting him up. He wants to. He has a greater desire. But the only one that can remove the stone is you. You have to remove it. You are the one that knows where it is. And I think today we need to go and turn our life and confess what it is that is stopping God's blessing from our life. What is it? And if you were to take and your drug, your life, and what's happening in your life, you have the answer. You know where you've been deficient. You know where you haven't been fulfilling your, your commission in serving the Lord. You understand that. You know it. You know it. So people, why are you allowing these things of life to stand between you and God's blessing? Why are you allowing God's power to be held back because you haven't taken that step of faith? What happened to the faith that you walked in when you see Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, and you were happy and joyful and singing and praising God, and now you're walking with your head down and saying, no, 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 I, this can't be happening to me. Get your head up. Get your head up. Because the first sign of defeat is a hang of the head. The very first moment you get bad news, the first thing you do, not to do this. Pick up your head. Look up to the source of Jesus Christ. Amen. Declare faith with your body language. Receive it in the name of Jesus. 
walk in power and authority because he has vested in you, he has believed in you, he has trusted you. So you need to understand that the only one that can stop God's blessing is not the people. It's the people you listen to and you allow them to influence your life. Amen. So you see in that very group. Okay? So now they're the two. Now they've all gone to the two. All these people were there. And when they're seeing that see Jesus weeps, they all have a comment. And these people said, well, couldn't this man that healed the blind to the same house? Why didn't he do that? Notice how they have an opinion? Yeah, everybody has something to say. Have you ever stopped at a car accident before? You see a car accident, it's already happened, and you stop. Nobody's going to confess, I know that. <laughs> you understand that? I tell you a story several years ago. The producers and Sessie and I were eating Whataburger there by Yarbrough and North Loop. We were, we were walking over, oh, bang, oh my God. And this guy hit, went right to the pole. The pole split the car in half. Then all of were like, oh my God. We, I mean, it's just, we were the first time, man. By the time we looked up, it's a done deal. What happened? When Brother Jordan now looked at one another, we're Sessie and Elsa. They're over there and looking in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and then people would come, you know what happened? Oh, and this is what happened. We all have an opinion. Uh, they want to take another peek. Huh? There's like a, uh, like a covering over the guy. Does it mean he's hurt? No, it means he's dead. It doesn't mean he's hurt. But see, different people start showing up, and then different people start giving an opinion, telling the story. They never saw it, but they gave their opinion of what was going on. See, and in life, so many people don't really know who you are and what you walk through. It can really hurt you. Amen. They can really take you down. Even by just saying something innocent, according to them, you're not in the position to receive it. You just need to be lifted up, not be thrown down. A lot of times we don't need to go up to somebody. You look terrible. <laughs> Even if they do look terrible, then you tell them, "What's up? How can I help?" See, because we have to be a saint of Christ's hands to help the others in God. And I love it because all this criticism is coming down. All these people are talking now. Jesus has opened up the tomb, and here we go. The first thing Jesus does, listen to me, before he brings Lazarus out, he takes care of the multitude. You ever realize that? He walks up to the tomb. And he stands there and says, Father, I thank you because you always listen to me. Jesus is yours. And I say not this for me, but for who? For all the multitude that's behind me. For the one that are saying, had he been here. For the ones who are saying he could have risen him. For the ones that said he healed the blind, look what happened here. For all these people criticizing, I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for them to understand who I am. I want them to understand my mission here on earth. I want them to understand I'm not just anybody. There was a purpose, a reason why this happened. I say this not for me, but for all these people behind me. People, you need to understand. You need to listen to God. Quit listening to people, concepts of people, the ideas of people. There's people that love you, want to lift you up, but there's people who want to destroy your life. You need to realize that. You need to be smart enough to understand that. And yet the only way can lift you up from the most difficult time of life is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ, who has to go to him. He says, I do it that they might know that you have sent me. And I'm being thankful that the Father sent Jesus Christ in thousand years ago Amen. to meet your need. For you to understand the most difficult times. When everybody says it can't happen, he says, yes it can because I'm in control of all things. God is in control. Ready to meet your every need. Who he hasn't risen from the dead yet. Everybody's still waiting for the moment. And here comes the shout of victory. Lazarus! Come forth. And here he comes all tied up. The moment he walks out like, oh! Now listen, if you go to the scripture, how many times did Jesus call out to Lazarus? Once. How many times did he say, Lazarus, come forth? How many times? Once. 
He only has to speak it one time. See, it's not over and over and over. Okay, let's try it now. Let's see if it works now. Let's do it now. But no, no, no. He's going to speak it one time, and it's going to happen. Because the word of God does not come back void. We need to understand that it was done in his time. Now, do you understand why he was four days late? Do you know why he was four days late? Because it was a mistake. There's an issue here in fight. To that time, they believed that the spirit of a person dead would hang around for three days. He waited the fourth day to make sure he was dead. They knew that he wasn't asleep. That people would understand he wasn't just sleeping. He was dead. And the miracle happened. That's why. See, God has a reason for everything. We just have to be patient and wait upon the Lord and know that he's going to do it at his time. Amen. And the days we walk through your trying time. Troubles are going through issues right now that need to be resolved. They've been going on for a week, two weeks, and you're trying to find an answer. And the answer still may have to come. Then we need to be still for just a moment and let him speak. But when we listen to God, he will speak one time and you'll be looked at. He will call you out of your problem. He will call you out of your despair. And we'll let you know, I will never leave you or forsake you. So today, as you wait, remember, those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Amen. They'll rise up like eagles. They will run and not get tired. We need one thing we need to understand our Christian law. How important it is just to wait for God to do his thing. Don't get desperate. Don't give up. Don't have the mindset, the attitude, initially by Martha and Mary that said, no, I can't. It's hopeless. No, it's not. As long as you have Jesus, it's not hopeless. Amen. As long as Jesus, the Lord, over your life, there's a hope. There's a ray of hope. Just hang in there. Just hang in there. Pastor, you know how tough it is to hang in there? Yes. Then you're done that. <laughs> How do you go person with that tell me, Pastor, I wish I had your life growing. Really, really. I said, why? He says, you don't have a problem in the world, really. I got my own, I got the church, and then I got yours. Sitting on my, sitting on my shoulders. To understand that to everything you go in life, wherever you're vested in, as long as you have the Lord, you have the answer. To see, as my, as my calling, I was going to say my job, but it's not a job. It's not a job, it's a calling from God. In my calling, my responsibility to God for you is to encourage you to walk forward. To understand, it might be raining, it might be pouring, but the one that controls the weather is Him. Amen. And the one that knows how much you can take is Him. So instead of just giving up hope, put your head up. Put your head up. It's difficult. It's difficult. I think one of the most difficult things now is to get the grandpa, right? How many know that pastor the grandpa? <laughs> you didn't know that? <laughs> I think one of the most difficult times as I I like to share my life with my grandkids. And then the boys of course are athletes, so I like to be there. It was about six years ago when we traveled to go watch Jake play or playing in the state playoffs. And the team should have beat them by tons, beat them by five points. And we're right there at the end of the game. And to watch it. Just kneel. Look at the scoreboard. Look at it and then hang it there. When you walk out, he was crying. He said, Nico, get your head up. Get your head up. You fought to the end, and this was. There will be a tomorrow. There will be a tomorrow. Different figures of life will really touch us. Things that happen to our kids really, really devastate us. Our kids don't really realize how special they really are. Because I think they see the discipline in our part. They see those parts in their lives. They can remember when you said no, when they wanted a yes. 
and they never, they cease to remember all the good things from their that mindset. Yet it hurts you to see the indifference so many times in their mindset and in their walk. How many know today that as you teach your children the word of the Lord, how many know that your kids might fail? You understand that? Understand that. They need you now more than ever. They need you. Well, they come from the same plant that we at one time made our own mistakes in life. So we should be understanding and loving and compassionate and be able to understand that they are the love of our life. How special they are to us and how much we want them to prosper. To understand that as we walk in that difficult time, be there for them. Be there for them. Let's not be so judgmental and more loving in the things that happen. You can have your moments of discouragement, but it doesn't mean that it's over. Everything is made new in the presence of God. Amen. And whatever has happened, transpired in the recent past, Lord and God said, let it go and let's move on. Let's not get into the mindset, had you been there, it would have happened. Let's not have that attitude. Let's say, thank you, God, because we have the opportunity to make things right. The last chapter has not been written, it's to be written yet. And the last chapter in Lazarus was the fact that he rose from the dead and Jesus was there. So today I encourage you to involve Jesus in everything you're doing, in your mindset, in your life, in everything that you are. And believe who he is. And trust him with all your heart. And know that because you love him and he loves you, he's going to do what's best for your life. And understand, a lot of times, your best and his best aren't in agreement. Because you know what you want and God knows what he has for you. So let's just stop for a moment and pray. Could some things be happening in your life if there's something better coming? There's something better up ahead? And certain things have to come to an end in order to go to the next dimension in your walk. Take a step of faith. Oh, let me make it a little bit bigger. Take a leap of faith. Because when you take steps, steps can be discouraged. I think the most discouraging part in my life when people say, I don't know what age I am, take me to the football stadium and I'll show you how old I am. I can't walk upstairs to the stadium. I went with Jake and Thelma to the Easter game. I actually had to they actually had to hold my hand to walk in the distance. Because I couldn't. I couldn't just hide it. You okay, Grash? Yeah, I'm okay. And as we got to that, we're going to sit down. I made the comment. I said, getting old, not really cool. And the people just laughed. You're okay, sir. You're okay. See, that had I taken a leap of faith, it'd be, I'd be a bigger person. This is the two hundred years to get to where I'm going. Take a leap of faith is going to teach you how to believe God. Amen. How to jump expecting Him to catch you. That's what it's about. Martha and Mary didn't have that kind of faith, had to pull it out. And when it's all said and done, see, I still Jesus. And as you go through life, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You need to take a leap of faith. You feel more secure with this stuff of faith? It's up to you, but do it. Do it. And watch God solve the problem. You have a need this morning? I want to pray with you. Would you stand and pray with you? That God would just increase our faith. Allow us to walk forward with determination. Say, God, I know you're going to do what's best for me. I know. I know. I know. Just give me the courage to accept whatever's coming up. Give me the courage to do this. To be willing to accept your will. And your will is perfect. We don't.
Remove all doubt. Remove all fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of tomorrow. Because in your corner is the great I am. Believe with all your heart as to who he is. Trust. Invite him. Come, speak to me. Speak to me. Speak to the Lord and tell him why you're standing. Be encouraged by speaking while you're standing. Because then you and I will, then you and God will be on the same plane. When we understand one another. This is why I'm standing, Jesus. I need you so bad. Be Lord over my life. Heavenly Father, I come into your presence. The child of your word has been delivered unto the people. It's their job to take a step of faith. The same Jesus that rose Lazarus from the dead is the same Jesus in this house today. Ready to meet the needs of those that come hurt, discouraged. Walking, Lord, seeking answers. Some have waited for a moment, for a while. Do not allow them to become impatient. Allow their faith to grow as they go through this trying time. Allow the Lord to sense your presence and let you know when it's all said and done, while I'm in your presence, then I will see your glory manifested. We wait upon that glory. We wait upon that miracle that we need this morning. We need about that inner strength to walk forward. God, I pray for all that are standing, whether they're here in the house or they're watching over Facebook today, that your presence would be there with them and let your glory be manifested to them. Let them know, God, that you're listening. Let them know that you're still in charge. Let them know you're going to produce for them what is best for their life. Help us, Lord, to release our will to us. To believe with all our heart. And to those that believe, all things are possible. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we place our need. I come to you. I come to you. There's voids in life that need to be met. Some walk into that moment having lost a loved one and there's a void that needs to be met. Oh, Holy Spirit of God, bring comfort and strength. Lift them up. Be glorified in their lives. Let them know you're walking with you. All the illusions of life, financial situation, anything, Lord, that comes to play in our lives, just give us peace. Peace be with you. Let there be peace on earth, Heavenly Father, and let it be good with me. And when peace comes, faith rises up. And when faith rises up, you move your hand. And we will receive our miracles. So, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, we place our lives in your hands. In the precious name of Jesus, I'm trusting you. Peace. Peace while we wait. Peace while we wait. separation from you. And let your blessings fall. Bring us out from the dead. Change our minds and our attitudes. We speak to life. We speak to life. 
And you said that he comes but to steal. And Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have an abundance. Let your abundant life flow in the precious name of Jesus. God is good people. Amen. Now, for all the people on Facebook, let me make this announcement with them real quick and then we'll move on to the house here. Next Sunday, we'll be on at 9 30. There'll be one service only at 9 30. We have communion at 9 30, then a worship, worship service, next day service at uh, 10 o'clock. We'll have a worship service like you're nursing, you're doing great service. Really, really good. Feel good song. Really, you're going to enjoy it. You get to sing, you get to listen to people sing, and you can thank the Lord for all his blessings. That's going to be at 10 o'clock. Once that service is over, then we'll have our physical feed, our Thanksgiving meal here at the church. We do it every year. The Sunday before Thanksgiving, we have our service, our Thanksgiving service. And we just want you to come and be with us. So, a lot of people watching on Facebook, well, you're welcome to come and join us and uh, come celebrate. And thank God for what he's done. I think I received a, a good compliment this morning. Really, Pastor? Yeah. They said, Pastor, you look like Thanksgiving. <laughs> I said, you call me a turkey or what? And he says, I'm trying to me away. Come on, people. We love to see you. We go this next Sunday, only one service, so don't be expecting two services. 9.30 next Sunday. We take uh, communion. Okay? People who God bless you, God bless you. Tomorrow night is prayer meeting, and then on uh, Wednesday night is Bible study, and then Sunday is church. God bless you.